Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems developer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going on an adventure back in time to retrocode some x86 assembly language. Come along for a few minutes as we ride the lightning to build the world's smallest fully functional Windows application. And I won't be hiding the details behind some fancy IDE. I'll do it live and raw right in a simple text editor and I'll explain how every detail works. And when it's time to build it, I'll shell out to the command line and do it like it's 1989. And did I mention I'd be doing it all live without a net? Yes, indeed, it's true. As you can tell by my long flowing grey beard and colourful robes, I'm one of the old wizards that actually wrote products like MS-DOS and I can still program in real assembly language. That's because I grew up in the 80s and 90s working on video games and operating systems back when ringing the last few drops of speed out of a CPU simply required that you spoke to it in its native tongue. Writing an operating system such as MS-DOS demanded that you work in assembly lest the bloat of a compiled language consume too much of the precious 640k of lower memory available. For size and speed, there's no beating assembly language. It's a bit of a lost art, however, as programmers don't use it much these days. Modern processors are fast enough and today's compilers effective enough that the C++ code written for them, if done diligently, will perform almost as well. But there's still always some certain portion of speed and size left to be found by the precision blade that is assembly language. Let me take a moment here to clear up one common point of confusion and that is the difference between assembly language and machine language. In assembly language, the directives represent fundamental operations that the CPU can perform and they are exceedingly basic like add, subtract, and shift. But naturally, the CPU doesn't use names for its instructions, it numbers them. Whereas we represent the addition opcode with the three letters ADD, the computer simply numbers the instructions and represents the addition opcode with the number 4. That would be a bit cumbersome for humans to work with all day long, so assembly language uses English mnemonics instead, but it's a direct translation from one to the other and they can produce exactly the same code. Because make no mistake, you can code in machine language and it's actually how I started because I didn't even have access to a symbolic assembler like MASM to do the translation for me. As a teen, I wrote a small game reminiscent of Galaga and I did it all in machine language using what's known as a machine language monitor. It allows you to key in the instructions and data manually in hex bytes. I can still even do it today from memory some 40 years later, or at least some of it. For example, I know without having to look it up that A900 loads the accumulator with the color code for black and that 8D21D0 stores it in the screen color register. I'll likely just always know that stuff. The only catch is that without an assembler, you can't move code around, at least not with the 6502 CPU I was using back then. The addresses are all hard-coded once an instruction is in place, so if you wanted to insert a new piece of code, you'd have to place it at the very end, jump out to it from the middle, execute it, and then jump back. It was a truly hideous way to work that generated complete spaghetti code, but it was quite an education. As a rule of thumb then, if you're dealing with the human readable form like add, it's assembly language. If you're dealing with the hex number 04, that's machine language, and as I said, there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping that can go back and forth without change. In my last retrocoding episode, I wrote Hello World for Windows in C. It was about the most basic app possible in terms of functionality with a main window, menu, about dialogue, and so on, all written directly to the classic User32 and GDI32 APIs. And yet when I called it bare metal programming, a few folks balked at that idea because C is technically an intermediate level language and thus isn't as low as assembly. That kind of misses the point that we were writing to the lowest level APIs possible, which is actually what I meant, but still the point was well taken. As Dr. Feynman once said, there's plenty of room at the bottom, so let's eliminate any remaining fat and see just how small we can make this thing. The C binary was a tad over 100k, but you can't make a direct comparison since it included icon resources. I imagine if we backed all the resources and runtimes out of that image, we'd be somewhere around 16k of code. And that's actually pretty tiny. In fact, if you're storing out a disk formatted with a FAT file system, odds are that it takes up a full 32k cluster no matter how small you make it, so does it even matter at that point? And besides, how small is small anyway? How small can you go in theory? Well, a single page's memory in Windows is 4k, and that's the smallest amount of memory that a process could theoretically occupy, so perhaps that's the ultimate goal. But can you really write a working program that will still fit in 4K? A Windows app that would fit into memory on the original Commodore PET? Let's find out right now. One thing we need to decide on is what we mean by a working Windows program. As a definition, I'm going to build an application very much like the Hello Windows app from the last episode, but without any graphical resources such as icons or menus that take up the extra space. 
We'll have a main window with a caption bar, a system menu, a close button, a minimize, maximize widgets, and everything should work properly. It should even custom paint its client area and render text and respond to sizing appropriately. That's the basics that I expect. While I'm getting the old nano editor ready, I should let you know that I'm now offering the classic Dave's Garage mug. It's the same one as designed by my daughter for my Father's Day present this year and features my son's original logo design and available in four custom colors. Visit the channel page and get yours today and rest assured that I'm still just in this for the subs and likes and that any net profits from merchandise sales will go to Autism Research. As you likely know, I wrote the original Windows Task Manager and I've also got a few of these super limited edition Task Manager enamel pins. How limited are they? I just had a small batch made for myself, but I've decided to give away a pair of the autographed pins to A, the subscribe user with a comment that receives the most upvotes on this video without actually soliciting upvotes, and B, one to a randomly selected subscribed user who makes any useful comment on the video. That way, I reward success and yet everyone still has a shot. But you've got to be subscribed to win, so be sure to comment and right now, we'll dive straight onto the editor and start building our app. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. I'm going to use Nano again as my editor of choice today. When it's time to assemble the code into working binary, I'll shell out and do that on the command line so you can see me do that in all of that nitty gritty detail. Our entire project will be included within a single source file, helloassembly.asm. That's it, that's all, no other include files or version files or manifests or other nonsense. Since we'll be omitting icons and other resources, there's no RC file to worry about either. This single ASM file will assemble directly into a working Windows application with no further intervention. Assembler, linker, program, run it. I love that part. No mystery, every byte has a purpose and every byte makes sense. To get started, we'll now create that single file, call it helloassembly.asm and start coding. Before we can enter any actual code however, as usual, there's some housekeeping to do. To wit, we need to configure the compiler and include the required headers and libs that our project will need in order to build. This is for most of us the least interesting part of any assembly project, but it's an important one, so let me quickly bang that out and get it done. Our first lines tell the assembler that we'll be working in the 386 instruction set on a standard flat memory model. In the olden days of segmented 16-bit code, you had the options of large, small, and even compact and tiny, but once you're 32 bits or better, it's all just flat memory model. The case map option ensures that our code will be insensitive to case unless it's referring to a system identifier. Next, we need to include our .inc files, which are to assembly language as .h files are to a C project. They include things like the structure definitions and the function prototypes for system calls in users32 and GDI. It's how the assembler and the linker know what arguments these functions take, for example. In assembly language, we can also specify the .lib files that will ultimately be used to link the binary to libraries and DLLs. These would include things like the import descriptor tables, strings, and other binary data that is needed to glue your code to the system APIs. If you want to call create window in user32, for example, the linker needs to know where in the DLL it's located, how many arguments of what size, and so on.
If I'm not mistaken, MASM is what's known as a two-pass assembler. On the first pass, everything is measured up and the assembler figures out how many bytes the instructions will take up and therefore where all the labels will land. It also has to know the signature of any functions it'll be jumping to or calling later, so we'll provide one for the single function that we actually jump forward to, our win main function that will be launched from the main code entry point. Here we have a couple of numeric constants to be used for the window size as well as two initialized string constants. Just like code, since these do not change, they will go into a read-only segment. Finally, we can start writing some actual code. Our main entry point will be unimaginably called main entry, and the first two things it needs to do will be to get a copy of the program's instance handle and then the text of the command line. I'll go back and fix typos like my datra up there, constants and datra, uh, in one big fell swoop at the end. I don't like to jump around too much while I'm actually coding. It takes me out of the moment, so... I realize it could be a bit maddening to stare at my boneheaded typos, but rest assured it will, in fact, assemble at the end before we're done, and I'll post the code with a link to uh, GitHub or Pastebin or somewhere that you can grab it. My plan is to have main entry call our win main in much the same way as Windows does itself if we were writing in C. There is a certain amount of preparatory C runtime code that helps prepare the startup that we'll need to do on our own when coding in assembly. We'll discuss it in more detail later, but when calling a function in kernel or GDI or user32, all we need to do is to push the arguments onto the stack in the order that they appear from right to left in the signature declaration. The convention for return value is that it is placed into the EAX register, so you can see once we come back I'm often storing the EAX result off into a variable. There's one significant difference between how I'm going to pass the command line to my own win main and how the runtime code normally does it. Normally, the program name is removed before you get the command line. If we call get command line directly like this, however, it still includes the program name as its first argument, so it's a minor difference, but you may need to keep it in mind for compatibility. There's technically a bug here, or at least a shortcoming. I'm not looking at my process's startup infrastructure to see if the window start mode, such as maximize, minimize, or default, has actually been specified there. I'm just going to ask for the default, which ignores the wishes of the parent process. It's a minor thing, but technically, you should start to see if the startup infrastructure specifies the use show window option flag, and if so, then use the show window setting from there instead. But I'll be content with the defaults in all cases. Looks like there's a bug in the nano editor. You see the word etc with a comma floating up there on the screen? I don't know why that gets orphaned on there, but it's not actually in the file. One modern, quote unquote modern, benefit of using the proc declaration here is that the function then knows not only what the incoming parameters are, but it also sees my local variable declarations. So at the end, when I do the return, it knows exactly how many bytes to pop off the stack. Normally, you've got to figure this out for yourself, but this is a nice idea because you won't get it wrong if it's doing it for you. Here is our win main entry. It takes the same parameters as we saw in our C version of Hello World. Essentially, the instance handle, the command line, an indication of what manner we should display our main window in. The first thing our win main does is to reserve enough stack space for three important local variables a win class structure, a message structure, and a window handle. In an assembly language program, you can simply reserve space for your local variables on the stack at the top of any function, and they will be around for the lifetime of that function call, and that's it. 
Keep in mind, of course, that simply reserving space doesn't clear or initialize that memory. If you need it clear, you'll have to do that yourself. Because remember, this is all pure asm and there are no helpers or runtimes running around behind you to tidy things up. By and large, if you don't do something yourself, it's not happening. The only help you do get is that the assembler will use the function signature to figure out the right number of bytes to pop back off the base or stack pointer when it returns at the end of it. These local variables are really just reservations of space on the stack which then get assigned an address that I can refer to. That's very handy because it's incredibly quick, but the downside, as I mentioned, is that it's not initialized to zero because it's simply advancing a pointer and reserving space for you, not doing anything with it. Conversely, our BSS segment, or the data space reservations at a global scope, those are actually cleared by the operating system for security reasons, so you don't see whatever was left behind there by the last person to use that memory, and for other reasons as well. So, as a general rule, your stack variables are not cleared or initialized, whereas your globals are. However, I don't like to rely on either behavior. As with our C version, the first thing our assembly version of Hello World will do is to register the window class type of the main window that we plan to create. Remember that the Win32 API doesn't know if it's being called by assembly or C. You still fill out the structure, including setting that first D word to be the structure size, in exactly the same manner. We specify that we want to be redrawn for any vertical or horizontal changes, what our instance handle is, what the window background color should be, our title, class name, and so on. Then we select the IDI application icon, which is simply the default system app icon, to be our icon. That avoids us having to create and store any resources of our own inside our application. Our next step is to specify that we want the standard arrow cursor and we pass our completed win class structure off to register class. After the window class has been fully registered, we can create our main window using that window class name. Create window takes a whopping 12 parameters, all of which must be pushed onto the stack in the correct order. So in assembly language, how do you pass arguments to a function call? Any way you'd like, as long as the caller and the callee agree. The fastest and easiest way might be simply passing the registers, but no matter where you draw the line, at some point you would run out of registers. And if you're also preserving their old values on the stack, that's a lot of stack and memory work as well. The catch is that the caller and the callee absolutely must agree because when we use the standard calling convention, for example, everything is passed on the stack. But not only does the receiving function need to know what the arguments are and in what order right to left, but it also has to pop them back off the stack before it can return to the caller. So the callee has to know the exact signature of how it was called, because that determines how many bytes would have been pushed onto the stack for it to clean up. Any mismatch here, of course, causes a catastrophic crash of the process or similar. We're going to let the system position our window by passing CWU's default, which basically means wherever you'd like. The only little space trick that I'm using here is to create the window with the visible style on right from the get-go, rather than creating it and then separately showing the window. It just saves a step and a single API call. After calling create window, we check the value of the window handle that comes back. If for any reason it's null, we know our window creation failed and we exit the application. In the normal success case, we next call update window to force our first paint and then continue on to pumping messages in our main message loop.
As soon as our window is successfully created, we call Update Window. That API directly calls our window procedure with a paint message, bypassing anything else in the queue. Our message loop is very straightforward. It simply calls get message until get message returns zero, and that's how we know when to exit the program. As long as messages continue to come into our message loop, we translate and dispatch them. Because we don't have resources, we therefore do not have an accelerator table, and that's why you might notice that I'm not calling translate accelerator and so on. Here's the end of our winmain procedure, and as you can see, when it's run out of messages to handle, it will ultimately return the wparam result of the last message successfully processed, which is nominally wmquit. So your program could return a value all the way back out to the caller on the command line simply by returning the wparam of wmquit. Our window procedure is what really defines how our application will behave because it's what in turn defines how each window message is handled. There are really only two messages we care about for our very simple application. The WM paint that will be sent whenever it's time to paint the window and the WM destroy message that signals it's time to exit. Handling WM destroy is quite straightforward. As soon as we see that message, we simply call post quit message with a zero argument on our application's message queue will shut down because inside our message loop, our get message call will then return zero and that's our queue to exit and return. No pun. This is the case handler for our WM paint messages. You'll notice you can't just push the address of a stack structure like the paint struct onto the stack. That's why we use LEA or load effective address to get the structure's address into a register EAX and then push that. We save away the device context handle that comes back from the begin paint call before we set the background mode for it to be transparent, which will affect how our text draws. With it set to transparent, we won't get that white box around our text. Our painting amounts to simply centering the text Hello Windows in our main client area. To do that, we push the address of our temporary rec structure along with the window handle and call Get Client Rect, which fills the structure out right in place for us. Then to actually render the text, we load up our option flags first. We'll indicate that we want a single line of text centered both horizontally and vertically. We'll push the address of the text and the HTC itself before calling Draw Text, which, as you can guess, does the actual drawing of the text. You might notice that here I'm adding the flags together, whereas in a previous example I used the bitwise OR operator. Either way works, I want to show you both.
To finish up our rendering, we simply pass our paint struct and window handle off to the end paint call. We then return zero because we need no further processing on that message. You'll notice I'm creating a zero in the EAX register by XORing whatever is in there now with itself, which by definition will clear the register. It's actually just a tad more efficient than actually loading a zero into it from immediate memory. And finally, for any messages other than the two we specifically handle, we simply pass them off to def window proc for the system to do its default processing on. We then end the window proc procedure and the main entry block, which completes our entire program. We can now shell out and build it and ideally run and test it. To build a working binary on the command line, we can do it all with MASM, the old Microsoft macro assembler. The assembler itself is called ml.exe and the only flag we need to specify on the command line is to let it know what kind of header we want on our output binary. In this case, we want cough format. We simply compile our assembly by giving the assembler the slash cough switch and the name of our assembly file and the rest is automatic. Out pops an application. Do you know why the first two bytes of every Windows PE program in the world are and always have been the letters MZ? Just like the first two letters of every MS-DOS program were MZ? It's because Mark Zubikowski said so, that's why. It's important to know that your program is not linked with any startup or runtime code. No stubs, no loaders, no headers, no nothing. That's why we had to take some manual steps like requesting the instance handle on the command line. Normally, the C compiler's runtime would set those things up for you, but with the assembly language, there is no runtime. It's just you and the CPU. Our first attempt yielded a binary that is 4096 bytes, precisely the tiny target we were aiming for. It further turns out that most of that space is not actually our own code. It is the important tables and string constants you pick up by linking to user GDI and kernel, the three DLLs that I rely on. That made me think that those tables might be fairly compressible, so I ran the UPX compressor on my binary and with that, it came out to 30,072 bytes. I'm pretty satisfied with 3K, but can anyone go smaller while still preserving all the functionality? There were a number of optimizations that I didn't take, such as tail call elimination, smaller strings, eliminating some air checks, and so on. To me, anything under 4K smells like victory, but I'd be curious to see if anyone can go smaller than that 3072. If we run the app, we find that it indeed works perfectly. It paints our greeting dead center in the main client area, it does it transparently over the gray background, then it repaints properly when we resize the window in either dimension. If we click on the close widget or select close from the system menu, the application shuts down just as it was designed to do. And that is that, a complete working Windows application in 3K. Is it the world's smallest Windows app? I believe it is, and unless and until someone shows me a working demo that is less than 3072 bytes, I stand by it. Notify Steve Gibson that there's a new king in town and bring me his crown and scepter. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Retrocoding and x86 Assembly for Windows. If you did, please be certain to leave me a thumbs up and to make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. I'm not certain how these programming adventures are going to be received, but if I see a bunch of new subscriptions, then I know I'm going in the right direction. I'll then make more like it, and if you turn on the bell icon, you'll even be notified of it when I do. It's a win-win. Besides mugs, I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons. I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be sure appreciated if you left me one of each before you left. That's all the time I have today, so in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage having problems with English, which is weird since it is my native tongue. That avoids us having to create or store any of our own resources. Uh, resources. No resources will indicate that we want a single line of text centered both horizontally, horizontally and vertonically. <laughs>